The Elementary Teachers Federation of Ontario has introduced new curriculum to require teachers to teach elementary students about white privilege. And the federal summer grant program requires applicants to attest to the values that the government believes in. They don't have to believe it. It's a fucking lie! But they... There's no such thing as compelled speech! No. That's pure narcissism at work, by the way. <laughs> you know, to hijack, a, to hijack an event like this that other people put time and effort into and to use the, their, their civility of the crowd and the civility of the organizers as an excuse to blatantly yell out your ill-informed opinions is no way to conduct a civil dialogue. It's absolutely appalling. The people who do that should be embarrassed. I, I guess I would also say that as students and as faculty members, you shouldn't put up with it. There's no way that you should allow people who are doing this to hijack your educational opportunities and to bend and twist the, the, the functions and the structures of the university. It's, it's not a good thing, not in any way at all. I would say that was a very disgraceful display, fundamentally. So Let's, let's stick with it. Why, <laughs> why do you think people are afraid of free speech? Well, you know... People develop an ideological view of the world because they don't want to think through things in real detail and they're aided and abetted in that endeavor by their pathological professors who are feeding them, uh, uh, what would I say, an oversimplified, an oversimplified radical view of the world that in my estimation is fundamentally based in, in resentment. Not that there's no reason for, say, a left-wing view of the world and we can get to that later. It's, it's easy virtue. You know, you can stand up in front of 900 people with your placard and your, and your screeching and you can, you can declaim to the entire audience your fundamental moral superiority. You can tell everyone at, at once that they're all beneath you and you're standing for the right thing and absolutely none of that is earned. You know, like, what the, he what the hell was that? There's, it's com no, seriously, man. There's just, it's just complete misbehavior. It's embarrassing. And the fact that pe the people who do that don't have enough sense to go hide their head in shame just tells you how badly socialized they are and how terribly educated they are. And the thing is, the thing that's so awful is that there are professors and educators who promote that. They say, well, that's how you change the world. It's like it is how you change the world, but it's certainly not how you make it better. You make it worse, clearly. You know, there's no comfort in that. And there's nothing about it that's impressive. It's no, it's no better in some sense than a two-year-old having a tantrum on the floor. It's, it shows, as far as I'm concerned, it, it, it approximates the same level of psychosocial development. So when the fact that, that this is happening continually at universities, is, it's, it, it, it truly makes me embarrassed to be associated with the university. And, and I say that with great displeasure because... You know, I've been working for great universities for a very long time, and the university is an absolutely remarkable institution. You know, it's survived for a thousand years. And, and to, see it, to see it brought down by, by people whose behavior would be out of place at a four-year-old's birthday party is, is something, something abysmal to behold.
agora da mídia. Quer dizer, a mídia representa, sobretudo, a pressão de uma opinião coletiva uniforme que vai moldando as opiniões dos indivíduos. É claro que eu, nesse sentido, não acredito de maneira alguma nem em liberdade crescente, nem em autonomia da opinião, muito menos entre os jovens. Porque eu me, até escrevi um artigo sobre isso, dizendo assim, quando um jovem se rebela contra seu pai e sua mãe, ele está se rebelando contra dois com o apoio de dois mil que são os seus colegas de escola. Quer dizer, ele se entrega numa massa, uma massa barulhenta, autoritária, mandona, a qual ele faz tu, todo o sacrifício para ele ser aceito naquele meio e depois ele se rebela contra aqueles dois pobres coitados de ficarem em casa e acha que ele é um grande, um grande é, herói da rebeldia. Não, ele na verdade ele é um conformista, ele está aderindo à opinião da massa. Ele precisaria ser corajoso para no meio desses dois mil ele dizer, olha, quem tem razão é meu pai e minha mãe. Se ele fizer isso, ele será linchado. É, é. Então, então, o que há é uma participação maior na opinião das pessoas da mesma idade. Ora, mas isso é justamente, porque nós, como nós falamos, uma massa uniforme é uma massa homogênea, não só na sua, nas suas opiniões, mas também no seu sentimento e às vezes na, na sua idade também. É para essa massa que a mídia fala e é a opinião dela que... Nós moldamos. Ora, a autonomia não consiste nem em ser conformista, nem em ser rebelde. A autonomia consiste em você ser conformista ou rebelde conforme as coisas a seu ver terão certo ou terão errado. Né? Se, por exemplo, se coincide com uma autoridade, eu acho que realmente que ela tem razão, eu a obedeço. E se eu acho que ela está errada, eu me rebelo. Quer dizer, a rebeldia não é um valor em si, assim como conformismo e obediência não é um valor em si. Há, há muita confusão nesse sentido. E quando as pessoas imaginam que elas estão ficando mais é, é, autônomas, elas simplesmente estão ficando mais rebeldes contra a autoridade mais fraca e obedecendo a mais forte. Está compreendendo? É que se você não sabe nada sobre a história das pessoas opressas, por mais que eu não gosto de se engajar nessa diálogo de diálogo sobre as condições atuais, é muito óbvio que a liberdade de expressão é uma liberdade que é particularmente importante para as pessoas que não têm nada mais que isso. Right? It's, if you're supporting freedom of speech, you're not supporting the status quo. I mean, just think about it. Let's, let's use the logic of the radical leftists and assume that society is a tyrannical hierarchy and the people at the top have the upper hand in everything, including access to communication. These people are not your friends. <laughs> And you say, you know, that's, that, that, and, and mark my words, that's the sounds of the barbarians pounding at the gates. Right. Yeah, that's, I'll, I'll tell you again, too, that use of inchoate, What would you call it? Inchoate sensation is the best formulation of their argument. And there's not much difference between knocking on the doors and knocking on you. So keep that in mind. It's not amusing. There's nothing to it. There's nothing for it. The thing that's also quite appalling is that there's no evidence whatsoever that the people who are conducting these protests know what it is that they're protesting against. You know, I was in... mal que eu fiz entre os 17, 17 e 21 anos, né? mais ou menos, tá certo? Então não tem essa desculpa de que ah, eu era um jovem idealista, eu falo, nunca vi um jovem idealista, o que eu vi na minha vida é muito jovem vaidoso, acreditando que ele tem a capacidade de reformar o mundo, a sua imagem e semelhança, e que o maior problema do mundo é que todo o poder não está na mão dele, isso, isso gente militante de esquerda eu só vi assim, ele é militante de todos esses movimentos, esse pessoal assim é tão burro, tão burro, tão burro, que eles não percebem que hoje em dia todos os movimentos de protesto do mundo, de reivindicação e de minorias, assim, todos, sem exceção, estão instrumentalizados 
pela elite globalista e trabalhando para o aumento do poder dela. É só você rastrear, assim, fazer a pergunta de onde vem o dinheiro. Hum? Você vai lá no site do David Horowitz, Discover the Network. Então você vai ver que ah, tem lá um movimento para salvar as focas, não sei aonde. Daí você vai ver de onde vem o dinheiro, vai rastreando, chega no Jorge Soros, chega na turma do Bilderberg, é sempre a mesma coisa, porra. É? Então, olha, direitos da mulher, direitos gaysistas, direitos dos animais, direitos disso, direitos daquilo. Quando você vai rastrear, é tudo a mesma coisa. Esse pessoal está todo trabalhando para a tal da nova ordem mundial, porra. Todo mundo são, são um bando de trouxa. Eu sei que isso, às vezes, é uma revelação tão traumática que o sujeito fica sabendo disso. É assim, meu mundo caiu, ele entra numa depressão, estoura os miolos. Eu não estou sugerindo que ninguém faça isso, tá certo? Mas você tem que enfrentar a verdade da sua vida, meu filho. É isso? Quer dizer, quem você está ajudando tá certo? com as suas ações? Né? Correto. Então, aí sim o sujeito tem que ter vergonha, porque colaborou ativamente, não durante três anos que nem eu, mas às vezes durante 30, 40 anos. Por exemplo, agora eu não acabei de explicar, para examina o conceito de socialismo na sua materialidade e você verá que o socialismo jamais pode aumentar a liberdade, a dose de democracia. É impossível. Né? Mas, se o sujeito quer apostar, vou dizer, se ele está encantado por uma figura de linguagem, então ele continua lutando por aquilo, os efeitos serão sempre diferentes daquele que está pretendendo. Quando ele descobre isso, ah, fomos traídos, fomos enganados, a coisa se desviou, fala, não, não é, é a lógica interna do conceito quando se torna a realidade. So, on the one hand, you say, look, you don't have a clue what you're doing, stay out of it, right? But we live in democratic systems where it's our responsibility not to stay out of it. So how do you manage that? Because you seem to be saying leave humility. it humility. Humility, right. But humility doesn't preclude activism. Uh, generally it does, yes. But Why? The, but Why that does doesn't mean to? that doesn't mean that I'm saying that there is no situations under which political action or activism is justified, because there are clearly situations under which it's justified. But it's not the first thing that you should be taught how to do when you're an eighteen year old person going to university and right. you don't know a damn thing. So I don't doubt that there's callow youth. I don't doubt that people have a lot to learn and that, Yeah, and they're and not that, learning it from their professors either. That may be true. That may be true. But you're clearly I mean, a big part of your narrative comes from that energy of resisting that kind of, you know... Circumventing it. Circumventing, but you're also yeah. saying, you know, these people who complain about the world, they should just focus on their own, their own, what they can control themselves and work within that space. To begin with. To begin with, but, but mm. equally, there is a slight derision in the tone about people who actually care about bigger than self it's issues. It's not slight. Okay, it's big then. <laughs> so, bigger than self problems, which are... They don't care about them. They just act like they just, they're just they? acting out Who? the delusion that they care But about which, them you, generally. You seem to be caught I up watch activists, the activists at the universities. Right. I know what they're like. And we've seen the videos and we know that kind of confrontation. Yes. And I don't You've seen doubt, Wilfred Laurier, for example. I've seen many, but I don't mm -hmm. doubt that there are those who who are like that. But there are many millions more, and I mentioned Gandhi, but, yeah. you know, arguably... You can't use him as an example. Okay, well, Buddha, for example. Or Buddha, him. Buddha, left his <laughs> Buddha left his wife and child. Yeah, but you can't use them as examples. Okay, First of then, all, like, Buddha's like Christ. It's like, well, there's Christ. It's, yeah, yeah, yeah. What, what do you mean? No, there's Christ no, in university activists? No, no, but it's there's... Like, no. Well, there, there's... Um, so Martin Luther King, can I use him? Yeah. Right? So Martin Luther King had an affair. It was quite yeah. well known. You know, his personal life was a bit complex. Yeah. But you wouldn't say that, you know, he had to sort that out before he went to sort of try and deal with civil rights in the U.S. So I'm just, I'm, get, I'm trying to get at the, the core of the tension. No, I would say that his own personal faults didn't preclude his social responsibility. Right. And it really is important to get that straight. But I would say that his own personal faults uh, served as a detriment to his overall mission. Right. Right. And then I'm, I'm not, believe me, believe me, I'm not saying that if I was in Martin Luther King's position, I would have done a better job. It's like, I am not saying yeah. that, man, yeah. not in the least. But back to the, the idea of sorting yourself out, it's like, well, first of all, it's a lot harder to do than you think. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've run students through this experiment. We used to do existential experiments in my Maps of Meaning class, and so the existential experiment was um, identify one thing that you think that, that isn't going well that you could fix, and then go try to fix it, and then just document what happens. Mm. It's like, well, you know. It's way hard. So uh, let me tell you a br brief story. I had one student whose mother had died, and the house was chaotic, and no one had picked up the necessary domestic responsibilities. And so he decided, and that wasn't good for anyone, and so he decided that he was going to step into the shoes of his mother. 
Well, God, I mean, it just provoked a complete bloody war in the household, you know, because who the hell did he think he is, and why do we need that, and why are you doing that, and aren't you making us lonesome for mom, and, you know, why do you think that you're better than us by taking up this responsibility, and so it's like, this, I'm going to go buy groceries, that was his plan, it's like, well, you know, that's a hell of a lot harder than you think, yeah. and so number one, cleaning up your room is proper, because maybe you can manage it, although probably you can't, because you could also extend that by beautifying it. But number two, it involves way more forces than you think. Yeah. And so, because to get your house in order is very, very difficult. But if it's so difficult, and I need to spend most of my energy and time dealing with that, who are the people who are going to be doing the other work that needs to be done socially and culturally and politically? Well, hopefully competent people. Right, with well, any right. luck. People who've so, already uh, done so that. You say, okay, that's interesting. So you're saying it's a necessary transition. You're saying there's something about the life... Jesus, I'm saying something simple. If you can't make your damn bed, quit waving no, but... placards at corporations. It's like, Jesus, it's like, so, seriously, so... man. It's like, what the hell? What makes you... You can't get this tiny little part of the world that's actually right at your feet, functional. You have contempt for it. It's just my but bedroom. that seems like gratuitous caricature of people. I mean, look... It's not they gratuitous. Not... Well, their, their flip on that is, look, why should I waste my time making my bed when we've got to deal with these problems in the world? You know, what because you, you risk inflating your own ego by right. dealing with the okay. problems of the world. So it's like the, it's the cathedral problem again. It's right. like, oh, I should be at the center of the universe. Right. So it's like, yeah, yeah, well, maybe, so maybe I'm not. I'm, I'm trying to find a resolution of this that, that goes beyond the existing cultural conflict around it. Because no doubt people need to attend to their own projection and their own limitations and have humility and some psychological insight and work harder on what they're directly responsible for. I don't doubt that. But I am concerned with a message that says that's all you should be doing, and until you figure that out, don't no, do I'm anything else. No, I'm not saying that's all you should be doing. But you are saying I'm you saying have to do it first. Before you can do that, you should be very leery of assuming that when you try to do something else, you won't just make it worse. And right. you will. Right. Look, I've dealt with people who've dealt with complex systems for yeah. a very long period of time. Right. And I know the difference between someone who can make a complex system better right. and someone who will make a complex system worse. And, and most that? people will make a complex yeah. system worse. Okay. That's that, for sure. So that, that's... Okay, that's good, because that's coming to the question of development and the question of human maturation and the question of what it means to unfold throughout the lifespan. So just to, just to try and distill that last point, you're sort of saying don't begin and end with your own responsibility of cleaning your room and sorting your personal and immediate affairs out, but realize that until you can do that, you may be lacking certain forms yeah, of maybe. competence that might make you doubt whether you should be quite so visceral and, and, and adamant about your political views. Precisely that, yes, right. and it's exactly the opposite of what students are taught in universities. It's but like, you're not saying don't care about those things or don't act on them, but just while you're doing them, attend to your own limitations and competencies. Well, I'm saying you should be aware of, you should be aware of your own competence and your limits. Right. And, and that, that's especially true if you're very young, because like, what the hell do you know? You haven't done anything. Right, right. You're like, I tell 18-year-olds, six years ago you were 12. It's like, right. what the hell do you know? Right. You, you haven't, you, you're, 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 you're under the care of your family or the state. You haven't established an independent yeah, existence. Right, right. You haven't had children. You haven't started a business. Right. You haven't taken responsibility for anything. You don't have a degree. You haven't finished your courses. You don't sure. know how to read. You can't think. You can't speak. You're, you're okay, ill okay, okay, enough, enough. You don't know how to present yourself. <laughs> well, Jesus, you know, yeah. and it's just not right to tell people in that situation that they should go out and change the socioeconomic okay, but, but structure meanwhile, of the what culture. They observe, what, those children, what those children or young people observe are not wise adults managing complex systems adeptly. They, they see people giving subsidies to fossil fuel companies. They see no, people they see activists injustice. teaching them at the university who are no smarter on, than they are. Jordan, and they think, like, well, I respect, can do that. You're so it's hung like, up yeah. on the university experience. Like, I, we keep coming back to this issue of the activists at the university, which is clearly very salient for you. But for those who are not there, it's frankly alienating. Because your, your other work is so fantastic, but it keeps coming back to this narrative of these slightly callow students who are maybe a bit over-enthusiastic about a political issue. Well, I'm more concerned with their professors than with the students. Oh, okay, also the and professors And I'm concerned about them. the professors because they've completely corrupted the humanities. Right. And the humanities are the core of the university. And by corrupting the humanities, they're corrupting the fundamental structure of our civilization. Right. And they're spreading that out into the general culture. Right. But and there's no excuse they, for that. They may be doing that, but simultaneously others are corrupting the ecological foundations, the social foundations. Democracy is arguably dying. There are real problems that are existential threats at a, a different level. There's, mu there's a Multiple, whole large yeah. variety of right. existential threats. And I don't threats. think that's happening principally because some people are being taught feminist theory in the University of Toronto. It's not that. It's something else, much bigger and broader and deeper, that when people raise these issues, you focus on that small issue, not the big ones that they're worried about. Well, it depends on the issue, I suppose. Um, 
I would say that... Climate change, for example, just for argument's sake. Well, what, what should I say about climate change? Well, what should you do? Did you if drive you're here? If you're, no, I didn't. I didn't. W what did you do? How did you get to, here? I took public transport. Okay, to well. You know. But that's not really, but again, that's hardly the point. I mean, well, no, it is the point. Well, it is the point because it's, in, it's part of the problem with climate change is irreducible complexity. Right. It's like, you right. know, we, right. we, there's a cost to our existence and the cost is externalization. Yeah. Right, externalization of costs, and right. we don't know how to manage that. Right. And I would say, should we be concerned about it? It's like, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Do we know how to be concerned about it? No, Not really. Not really, right. So, so then how do we learn? That becomes the question, right? So the younger generation who are, who are oh, likely I can give to be you an example. more directly affected, the kinds of yeah. people in you know, developing countries and younger people who feel the pinch of this all the more because yeah. they can see, for example, New York, the chance of it being underwater by, by the end of the century is not negligible. Um, and therefore, they're looking for a response that really matters to them. And when you think about responsibility, that's they think, easy. That's easy. No, but their view is, don't patronize me about my bedroom when I've got the planet to save. I'm not patronizing you. I think no, not your me. bedroom is I'm important. I'm just saying that there is a, no, no, I there know. Is a voice. No, I understand. I think your bedroom is important. Right. Yeah, I, so do, so do, I mean, they no, might but I too, seriously but they think, think the that. whole planet is more important. They're more concerned about that. Um, and, and why the, is your that bedroom wrong? is a microcosm of the planet. Right. Well, that, tell, yes. tell us about that then. Why well, that let's, the let's, let's go back to the climate issue here first. Because uh, there's this guy that I'm aware of. His name is Boyan Slat. And I'm going to talk to him in the relatively near future, I think. And he's a model for, for young people. He went out scuba diving when he was 17. And there was a lot of plastic, you know, and that sort of bothered him. And then he started thinking about manta rays and how they move through the water. And then he noticed that most of the plastic was in the top six inches. And then he thought... I wonder if I could build a machine that was like a manta ray that would float on top of the water. And anyways, to make a long story short, he's devised a way to rid 50% of the plastic in the world's oceans within five years and has spent the last six years developing that and is well on the way to implementing it. And it looks like it might work. And he's going to be able to make a profit from it just to add that extra bit of punch. Yeah. And so Bayan Slot, I would say, it's like, I don't know if his room was clean or not, but right. there was something about him that was dead on because when he looked right. at a problem like that, he thought, I'm not going to go out there and tell a bunch of other people what they're doing wrong so that they can solve it. I'm going to right. bloody well fix it. Right. 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 And, and that's what I'm telling young men in particular right. to do. Okay. Although, you know, I'm, if young women want to do that, it's like, great, more power to them. Right. Right. But, you know, people say, well, I'm taking climate change seriously. I'm going out to protest. Like, right. you're not taking it seriously. That's not serious. Serious is you're going to devote 80 hours of your life to it for right. the rest of your life, right? right? You're going to work on that so intently that you're not even going to think about okay. anything else. Okay. Like, so it's, that's so it's, serious. So what you care about... Outro dia, eu ouvi uma análise feita pelo Gerald Celente, que é um analista, aliás, ótimo aqui, tem feito há vários anos previsões acertadas, e ele fez uma análise que é interessante, mas só parcialmente verdadeira. Ele diz que a crise econômica mundial, fomentada inclusive por essa política de empréstimos americanos, que já emprestou, emprestou não, deu de graça, trilhões para bancos, empresas, etc. etc. É, isso aí está criando uma frustração mundial, porque as novas gerações recebem os seus diplomas universitários e não têm emprego. Tá certo? E ele diz que isso aí é uma das causas de descontentamento e, portanto, é uma espécie de revolução mundial que está explodindo. Bom, essa análise é só parcialmente verdadeira, porque a ideia que está subentendida é que todos os jovens têm um direito ao emprego universitário, o que é uma ideia intrinsecamente absurda. Né? Na verdade, se você dizer que todos os jovens têm direito ao emprego universitário, é uma coisa dizer que toda a humanidade tem direito ao emprego universitário, e ninguém vai fazer serviço braçal, ninguém vai limpar a rua, ninguém vai plantar, ninguém vai colher, ninguém vai trabalhar em fábrica, etc, etc. O problema com a sociedade moderna é justamente é que ela é baseada numa fraude. Toda a sociedade moderna, a sociedade capitalista, como a sociedade socialista, é baseada numa, vamos dizer, numa promessa de uma prosperidade sem fim, na qual todos serão libertos vamos dizer, do, do trabalho, sobretudo do trabalho braçal, das formas de trabalho mais humildes, e todos serão doutores. Então, evidentemente, isso é fácil de prometer, mas é impossível de cumprir. Então, você tem uma situação vamos dizer, que é permanente estímulo às explosões revolucionárias. Se você observar todos os movimentos revolucionários dos últimos dois séculos, foi tudo feito por estudante, ou por intelectual, ou que, pelo, por aquilo que é chamado burocracia virtual. São aqueles camaradas que entram na, na carreira universitária, entram no estudo universitário, com a esperança de que o governo lhes dê um emprego. E depois, não tem emprego. Então, Dizer, eles, são, eles são treinados para ser burocratas, mas não tem lugar na burocracia. Então você sempre tem um excedente e excedente, 
vamos dizer, é a pólvora, é, é a sementeira da revolução. E isto não vai terminar enquanto a civilização não entender que ser doutor não é um objetivo na vida, não é uma coisa que todos possam aspirar. Né? Ser doutor não é um direito de maneira alguma. Né? Quer dizer, o ingresso na profissão intelectual não é um direito, é uma coisa que o sujeito tem que conquistar mediante provas cabais da sua capacidade. Agora, você vai me dizer que todos esses moleques que estão gritando no Egito, ou, ou em todo lugar, todos eles estão capacitados? Não, isso é um bando incapaz, assim como aqui. Mas essa greve de professores aí, né, exigindo a sindicalização obrigatória, isso é um bando de picareta. Né? O, 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 o líder do negócio, até discursando, ele disse, o, em vez de dizer the, the state owe me... É, não sei quantos dólares, é de, ele diz The States Army. Né? Você, você não sabe nem falar, é um analfabeto como o doutor Emir Sader, o qual comentaremos daqui a pouco. Quer dizer, como é que um cara desse pode ser professor e ainda querer um salário maior? Quer dizer, as exigências que eles estão fazendo são absurdas, porque o dinheiro vai sair do bolso do contribuinte. Quer dizer, os caras que trabalham têm que pagar para esses filha da puta, para esses vigaristas. Né? Então, olha, qualquer greve de professor é sempre injusta, sempre injusta, porque o que os professores da presente geração estão fazendo com as crianças é absolutamente criminoso. Essas pessoas não só não deviam ser pagas, quando deviam ser todos mandados para casa, né, dar uma vassoura para cada um para varrer chão, né, ou faz que nem em Cuba, manda o cara cortar cana, porra. Um, they transformed the Marxist dialogue of, of rich versus poor into oppressed versus oppressor and Foucault in particular who never fit in anywhere and who was an outcast in many ways and a bitter one and a suicidal one his entire life did everything he possibly could with his staggering IQ to figure out every treacherous way possible to undermine the structure that wouldn't accept him in all his peculiarity and it's no wonder because there would be no way of making a structure that could possibly function if it was composed of people who were as peculiar, bitter and resistant resentful as Michel Foucault. So you couldn't imagine a functioning society that would be composed of individuals with his particular makeup. In any case, he did put his brain to work trying to figure out A, how to resurrect Marxism under a new guise, let's say, and B, how to justify the fact that it wasn't his problem that he was an outsider, it was actually everyone else's problem. And he did a pretty damn good job of that and laid the groundwork for this for the, what would you call it, the rise of the marginalized against the center. And Derrida's thinking is very much the same, you know, Der, Der, even though Foucault and Derrida hated each other and, and regarded each other as intellectual charlatans, which was about the only thing either of them was ever really correct about. <laughs> so... Então, voltando agora ao, ao, ao problema inicial do, do, do uso da palavra doutrinação, eu adverti, não se deve usar isso no sentido de que há uma transmissão de uma doutrina. A doutrina da, da esquerda, a doutrina comunista, ela já se desmantelou, ela já se desfez. Você não tem mais uma ortodoxia. Pronta, arrumadinha e condensada em manuais, como tinha no tempo, nos anos 50, 60. As doutrinas vinham pontinhas da do Comitê Central da, do Partido Comunista e se disseminavam pelo mundo. Você tinha aulinhas de marxismo, leninismo, essa coisa toda. Então, você tinha muitos militantes prontos para repetir a doutrina exatamente uniforme. E, após, após os anos 60, o movimento comunista ele se diversificou. Ele está atualmente organizado não como uma hierarquia, mas como uma rede onde mil doutrinas diferentes são aceitas. <risos> e essa mesma michola ideológica facilita o crescimento do movimento, porque as pessoas aderem sem nem precisar saber a quem estão aderindo. Estão aderindo <risos> onde há um estado de espírito, há uma comunidade de sentimentos, há um grupo de referência e não há uma doutrina. É certo? Então, eu sugiro que vocês leiam o último artigo que eu publiquei no Digesto Econômico, sob o título A Destruição da Inteligência, onde eu explico mais ou menos o seguinte. Todo e qualquer aprendizado humano começa com a imitação da alguma coisa. A criança começa, por exemplo, a imitar os seus pais para aprender a falar. Porém, a imitação funciona porque você imita uma coisa, depois imita outra, depois imita outra, depois imita, outra, depois imita, imita milhares de coisas diferentes. E com esses vários fragmentos de, de, 
imitação, depois você compõe o seu mundo próprio. Mas, se você durante anos a fio é induzido a imitar sempre os mesmos cacoetes, trejeitos, sentimentos, reações, com medo de que se você falhar em imitar isso, você será rejeitado pelo seu meio e eventualmente terá destruída a sua carreira universitária, então a sua capacidade de imitação criativa acabou. Você já está imbecilizado, a sua mente está paralisada aos vinte e poucos anos. E é isso mesmo que está acontecendo nas nossas universidades. Não é preciso dizer, como eu já disse, que o efeito disso não se esgota só na deterioração intelectual, mas entra na deterioração psicológica, moral, etc. These articles, it's like, as far as I'm concerned, they're a dime a dozen. I don't even have to read them anymore. That's the thing about reading something an ideologue writes. You just have to look at the first sentence and infer the rest. You know, it's true, man. It's actually, this is one of the things that Solzhenitsyn did a brilliant job of analyzing in the Gulag Archipelago. He said, that's the consequence of turning your God-given soul over to human dogma. You're just a puppet for these ideas that are operating behind the scenes. You think you have the ideas. It's like, think again. They have you, and they're doing with you what the ideas want to have done with you. And when they're done with you, they'll discard you, you can be sure. And you'll be lucky if there's anything left of you when that happens. So, and the universities are absolutely complicit in this. They take young people whose minds are, are, who are looking for an identity and no wonder. And they teach them this algorithmic idiocy that anyone with any brain could learn in a week. The, 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 the dictums and dogma of the oppression versus oppressed narrative. God, it's unbelievable. You know, a decent chatbot could write most of the postmodern papers. That's why, that's why they, that's why the typical humanities, 80% of humanities papers now garner zero citations, which means the only person who ever reads them is the person who wrote them, and even they don't do a very good job of reading them. So, yeah. Você conhece alguém que foi alfabetizado pelo método Paulo Freire? Eu nunca vi ninguém, nunca vi uma única pessoa. Foi pro brejo. Eles ficam seguindo esses caras aí, Jean Piaget, Vigote, Emília Ferreira, um bando de picareta, porra. Então, mas eu não consigo entender se depois que eles apareceram no Senado da Educação Brasileira, a educação foi pro Vinac, como você pode dizer que esses caras são gênios? Quem é gênio? Não, eu... é, mas é o raciocínio dele, pois é. Mas olha, é aquela piada do Jaguar. O Jaguar era um cara de esquerda, mas de vez em quando ele tinha uns lances espetaculares. Né? Era uma, uma, uma charge que estavam duas pessoas saindo do cinema, né? e eles diziam assim: o filme é uma bosta, mas o diretor é um gênio. Né? Então é isso aí mesmo. Eles não educam ninguém, mas são grandes educadores, porra. Olha, eu eduquei mais gente do que o Paulo Freire, porra. Né? Os meus alunos com dois anos de curso dão baile nos caras que estão na universidade. Não, é o povo da incoerência, né, professor? Educador sou eu, esse cara é um bosta. Né? Olha o Paulo Freire, você viu a carta que a mulher dele mandou para o jornal outro dia? Outro dia não, faz uns dois, três anos, sei lá. A carta cheia de dinheiro de português, o cara não alfabetizou nem a própria mulher, meu Deus do céu. Hã? Como o senhor colocou na coluna, às vezes até alfabetizou, né? Pois é esse que é o problema. O alfabeto sua, ela ficou escrevendo daquele jeito. Olha, você tem que ver as pessoas, vamos dizer, o ditado, o Confúcio que dizia, o sábio, primeiro ele conserta a si mesmo, depois conserta a sua família, depois conserta a sua rua, depois conserta o seu bar, depois conserta a sua cidade, depois conserta a sua província, depois conserta o seu país, depois se der com um certo mundo. Esses caras não se consertam nem a si mesmo, já querem consertar o mundo, porra! Não tem condição. Vai ver os filhos desses caras, o que que são... É tudo delinquente, é tudo drogado. Agora eu tô aqui, pô, eu... Claro, no começo eu criei, tive dinheiro na educação dos meus filhos, mas depois fui acertando, acertando. Hoje aqui, tô muito orgulhoso. Meu filho Pedro acaba de se formar nos Marines. A minha filha Leila tá fazendo uma carreira brilhante. Tá todo mundo indo pra frente, todo mundo feliz. Não tem nenhum neurótico, não tem nenhum drogado, não tem nenhum bandido na família. Porra! 
É isso que você tem que ver, o educador tem que educar a sua família, em primeiro lugar, mas como é que começou a educação moderna? Começou com o Jean Jacques Rousseau. Jean Jacques Rousseau mandou cinco filhos para o orfanato e depois escreveu um livro de educação. E esses caras são a mesma merda, porra. O cara não educa nem a própria mulher, quer educar os outros. Ah, bom, mas isso aí é fácil, porra. Se você vai fixar complicados, você tem que aprender como fixar simples problemas primeiro. Then you get good at it. I'm not saying that young people don't have things to be concerned about because life is a concern, right? I mean, it, life is a fatal disease. It's a concern. You're not on top of it. There's always more challenge than you can take on in some sense. But complaining about the structure of being and attempting to reorganize massive social structures, especially when you don't know the first thing about them, which is generally the case, is just not advisable. And the universities, you know, they teach young kids, young people, 19, 20 years old, that they should be out attempting to rectify massive social organizations. It's like, you wouldn't go and try to fix a cruise ship. You know, things are complicated. You can't set, it, set your own room in order. You can't set your own family, your life in order. What the hell makes you think you ready to take on something like the political system? That's hard. You're going to mess it up, man, for sure. Yeah. Right. What, what is the path that you have traced between the Marxist infiltration of American higher education, or Western higher education for that matter, and what extremities we now see in the American left's dominance of universities. You know, the tearing down of statues, the banning of Shakespeare from the curriculum, this sort of endless war against uh, white males, the uh, affirmative action and, and race baiting and gender baiting and so on. W what is the path so people who are considering university, which, you know, was a fairly unquestioned benefit in the past and now I think has has some challenges in terms of justifying the cost benefit. What is the path between the post-war period and what people are seeing now in North American campuses? Well, uh situation is a little paradoxical because by one side you have this multitude of agitators and crazy people, uh, uh, drug young people, and so on. And by another side you have the multi-billionaire elite that controls them. Hmm? So it's, this is a constant in history. The highest powers make an alliance with the, uh, how say, the underdogs the underdogs, to control everything that is in the middle, that is the majority. This is very, a very intelligent scheme and very difficult to, to stop. And this is what happened in America. You see George Soros and uh, Zuckerberg and, and Bill Gates, all these people uh, orienting and commanding these anarchists in, in, the, in the, the universe. Huh? And the people is pressed in the middle, they squeeze it in the, in the middle of this double pressure. Pressure from above and pressure from, um, from below. This is the same strategical scheme of the communist movement with another uh, symbolic content. It's not economic insatisfaction anymore, it's sector insatisfaction, social insatisfaction, psychological insatisfaction, and so, so on. But this is the same scheme. Pressure from above and pressure from below. And there is this very frustrating double think or hypocrisy on the left where they use freedom of speech to promulgate their own theories, but then when other people come to criticize them, there's this shutdown of freedom of speech. And they, they understand the value of freedom of speech for their side. But the intolerance of the supposedly diversity worshipping group, the intolerance and hostility and, in fact, hatred towards opposing viewpoints that they're, I think, clearly not competent to debate on rational or empirical terms, seems to be playing out in a sort of end game scenario in, in Western universities at the moment. I believe there's something worse than hypocrisy. You should read the book by the Polish psychologists, psychiatrists. Andrew Lobachevsky, do you know him? No. no. Well, this guy has been studying the uh, Polish elite, communist elite, for 40 years. And he verified all these people as psychopaths. Mm -hmm. All of them, all the elite are psychopaths. And he discovered that when a country is governed by the psychopathic elite, everybody around gets hysterical symptoms. What is his his theory. His theory is to believe not what you see, but what you say. You say, you listen to it, and you persuade yourself. 
So you live in a parallel world, huh? a world created by your own words. And of course, these mega billionaires and most people in the government are all psychopaths. They have no morality, no sense of, of duty or good and evil, etc., etc. And well, they contaminate other people. But these people, the militants, the masses, don't get psychopaths. They they get hysterical. And mm -hmm. all those guys in the universe are, are hysterical. So they are not properly hypocritical because they don't uh, they don't know they are lying. They persuade themselves. And this <laughs> self-persuasion is purely hysterical. I recommend his book, Dr. Lobachev's book's course is called Ponerology, from the Greek uh, word poneros, that means evil. So Ponerology is the study of evil in politics. It is a very important book. And I can ask, how do these people, these leaders and mega billionaires and so on, and intellectuals, manage to persuade people of such a stupidity? Yeah. The secret is this. Psychopaths have an abnormal psychological aggressivity. They are and, uh, lots of psychological power. They intimidate people by their very eye eyesight and their ways of speaking. So, Ralph Marx used to ask, uh, after all, will you believe me or your own eyes? <laughs> Psychopaths make people believe me, not their own eyes. And this is the mechanism of psychopathical persuasion that turns people into hysterical. Uh, from the moment you start believing what you are said and not you, you are seeing, you are hysterical. And you can believe anything. And this is the mechanism. They are controlling lots of people by this dirty trick of psychological aggressivity. Will you believe me or your own eyes? Oh, you, you, you. Right.